but have also exposed occult behavior going on in churches. They don't even know because they're not even being taught. And so the enemy is very slick. All he does is just take an occult practice and he relabels it and sprinkles it with some Christianese and people buy into it. Pastor Billy Crone, it's great to have you here on Charisma. And I've been looking forward to this because I had that opportunity to look at some of your YouTube channel videos and you have yep. done quite an extensive deep dive into some very let's say interesting topics that the church doesn't normally talk about at all. Um, And most of the time it says, let's just save that for the fringe group over there, but you're dealing with it head on on Sunday mornings uh, and any other time that you can, because these are things that the church needs to deal with. And I'm talking about secret societies and uh, different things like that. So before we get into that though, pastor Billy, I want to, let people hear your testimony. You started telling me a little bit beforehand, uh, but I was blown away already. So just to tell us about who Pastor Billy is. Uh Aha. Well, yeah, thanks, John. Thanks for having me on. It's a treat. And uh, yeah, what a privilege to be able to share uh, God's story. It's his story of what he's done with a a wretch like me. And uh, hopefully it would encourage people to never give up. Uh, I was a a blasphemer. I was not raised in the church. I grew up in in the Midwest, Kansas, Nebraska. I was turned off to Christianity early on, basically with the hypocrisy that I saw growing up. Uh, I've done just about every drug under the sun, uh, was involved in all kinds of sin, immorality, but basically a 1980s ex-headbanger, drug addict, sexually immoral, male chauvinist pig guy involved in the occult. When I was about 16 years old, I uh, was so uh, depressed and uh, longing for purpose in life. I unfortunately uh, did my first prayer, and that was a prayer to Satan. And I said, Satan, you could have this life if you give me power and significance. And to show his character, uh, John chapter 8, Jesus said, Satan is a liar. He's the father of all lies. He's a murderer, and he's been one from the beginning. Well, within three months of that, sure enough, I tried to kill myself three different times. And uh, twice with pills, that didn't work. So I shot myself once in the chest here with a rifle. And to be honest with you, John, I didn't want to die. Uh, that was, I guess, my unfortunate way of letting people know that I'm dying on the inside. And I, I don't have any answers. And the sad thing is, I was surrounded by people who professed to be Christians. I was surrounded by churches, but nobody was telling me about Jesus. And again, back to the hypocrisy, when I'm wanting answers for life, the guys that I'm partying with during the week, on the weekends, doing the sinful, rotten things, guess where they would go on Sundays if they weren't too hungover or strung out? Church services. So, of course, they weren't telling me about Jesus. And, of course, the message, though, they were loudly declaring to me was, apparently, Christianity is a joke because I don't see no change in you and no difference. You're just like me. So when I finally got uh, awakened to spiritual things, wanting to find out what is life all about, why am I here? You know, the classic bare bones questions that everybody has. Uh, I was on my own. So unfortunately, I uh, went from making that pact with Satan. I ended up uh, moving from Kansas to California. And for a while, I tried to reform my life and get an education. I cut my hair and did all those things that society says you need to, you know, uh, have a successful, great life and fill that hole in your heart. And unfortunately, one of my roommates, uh, he turned me on to the Satanic Bible, Anton LaVey. And that invited, unfortunately, a lot of demonic activity that most likely if I wasn't already by then, I was probably that was my first time being possessed. Uh, And then I went from there uh, to make matters worse. I had a co-worker who introduced me into New Age and New Age. If your audience is not familiar with that, it's basically uh, uh, making up your own religion as you go. You get to be God, the live Genesis three. You get to determine what's right and wrong. And so it's kind of like a cafeteria. You know, you go down the line and you say, I want a little bit of this. I'll put that on my plate. I'll take a little bit of this and put it on my plate. Same thing when it comes to religion. So I'll take a little Buddhism. I'll sprinkle that on. I'll I'll do some Eastern mysticism. I'll even do some self-help secular psychology. I'll I'll just, you know, maybe even a little bit of Christianity. Nothing convicting. You know, everybody loves the golden rule. But, you know, you just throw it all together and that becomes your reality. Well, with that reality comes you're trained to uh, become a disseminator of this truth, this new truth that you get to make up. And in order to get that truth, you have to have the Space Brothers, believe it or not, UFOs came into this, uh, uh, the uh, spirit guides and things of that nature to come inside you and speak through you, which I didn't know it then, but obviously now it's you know communicating uh, uh, that mediumship that God condemns in Deuteronomy 18. But, but now I'm multiply possessed. Uh, and of course you go down this route, uh, the darker it gets. And, and what happened, what was happening, John, I literally, right before I got saved, uh, these guys were either, they were trying to kill me. So I would join them one day in the lake of fire. 
uh, or and or they were driving me insane. In fact, even as a non-Christian, right before I got saved, uh, it, it got so bad that I had to watch TV or read a book or just look at something to maintain my sanity. They were driving me insane. In fact, as a, and this is what came to my mind, even as a non-Christian, that I was walking a razor's edge in my mind, being demon possessed, and that uh, if I if I didn't fight this, if I if I, if I even just for if I slacked off even for just a little bit, I literally knew what it was going to be like to go insane and not come back, and that that literally went through my mind. What makes it worse is I can't string enough uh, words together in English to describe to you what is it like to be demon possessed because it's not on the outside of you. That's bad enough. It's on the inside of you, and you're not in control. And then when that thought hits you, uh, it's it just fuels it. So anyway, long story short, I didn't see it coming. It was almost like God says, okay, now's the time. Snaps his finger from heaven, so to speak. Says, watch what I do with this fool. And uh, so the the demonic terror, I just got into my apartment. It hit me again. I was all by myself. I, I, I scared me so bad this time that my re- reaction, though, this time was I ran to my bedroom. I was 25. I dropped on my knees. And I said, I said, God, if you're real and you want this life, you can have it. I spent the, the last 25 years messing it up. But I knew enough that I needed to call upon the name of Jesus Christ from two Christians who dared to witness to me. And I was mean and nasty to him. I was mean and nasty to every Christian. I was a blasphemer. And so I followed that up with this. Jesus Christ, would you please forgive me and save me? And bang, instantly, man, it was just, it was just like the scripture says, from darkness to light instantaneously. It was like the way the world came off of my, uh, out of me shoulders. I'm sure that was the demons leaving me. The first couple of days, I'm not joking. It's like somebody messed with the the color hue. Uh, the sky was bluer. The grass was greener. I mean, it was just, I was a brand new creation in Christ. And basically, I, I, I'm i all by myself. Uh, all I knew is I called upon the name of Jesus Christ and something had radically changed. I started going to church services. I figured that's what you're supposed to do. I'm a Christian now. I found a Bible, started reading it. I figured that's what you're supposed to do. I'm a Christian now. And so two weeks old in the Lord, I'm reading the Bible before I go to bed. And I close it. And I simply said, God, I want to know more. So the next day, I woke up with the idea that would not leave my brain, go to Bible college. And I'm going, man, God, that can't be you because I, I'm disqualified. I'm, I'm the guy that was involved in the occult, the, the drug addict guy, the, the whor- blasphemer, no way. Anyway, long story short, it persisted. Eight weeks after I got saved, I'm in Bible college. I was not raised in the church. I knew nothing. I, I had to keep my thumb at the beginning of the Bible just to find out, okay, what book, where's that? What I knew nothing. I just wanted to learn. I had no idea that God was going to call me to do what he's having me do today. I just wanted to know more. And so basically, eight weeks after I'm saved, I'm in Bible college. And for the next seven years, I'm there. And then later seminary, uh, I started pastoring uh, before I graduated Bible college in California, which is where I got saved, Northern California. Then for several years uh, there, and then I took a position. I pastored for five years in New York, and now I've been 13 years in Vegas. Wow. So you went from darkness to light in a drastic way. Yeah. And, um, you know, I... I find it very interesting that in today's day and age, um, there is a rise of cessationists um, that it seems like that's something that they're um, they're coming more of a forefront attacking the spiritual. Um, and yeah. so in saying that that doesn't exist, you have a very unique vantage point where you came from such darkness in the occult, in Satanism, where that is nothing but spiritual. Yeah. Um, but, but now you're dealing with uh, good spiritual things uh, on God's side. Uh, so whenever you're, whenever somebody brings up, oh, that's not real, how do you deal with that? <laughs> well, one, uh, always go back to the scripture. Uh, and that's why I say all the time, John, when I teach, I say, and where am I getting this? The Reader's Digest, my personal opinion, social media. Oh, that's right. I'm quoting the Bible. Old and New Testament, you talk about spiritual warfare, you talk about, talk about demons, you talk about the reality of, of evil, and Satan is not a joke, it's it's real, demons are real. It's all over the Bible, Old and New Testament, what verse do you want, how many do you want? And as a Christian, we're supposed to be taught the whole counsel of God, so how can you sit there and cherry pick and dance around something that's all over the Bible? Not an isolated case here and there uh, that you could try to excuse away, this is everywhere. Well, I think I know why. Number one, uh, if you were the enemy, then... What's one obvious thing that you would try to get people to do? Not believe in your existence, because then you would have a heyday. And John, I don't know if you've seen the uh, recent stats, 65% of those who profess to be Christians in the United States of America do not believe in a literal devil. I wonder who put that idea in their head. So if I was Satan, of course, I wouldn't want people to know, because then you're going to give him even more free reign. 
And that's why for years, you can see behind me, I've written so many books, uh, not just on the occult, but a lot of them, but I've also exposed occult behavior going on in churches. They don't even know because they're not even being taught. And so the enemy is very slick. All he does is just take an occult practice and he relabels it and sprinkles it with some Christianese and people buy into it because they're not being taught. And again, these are not isolated texts. Read the scripture. The Bible is a supernatural book. Yes, God is supernatural. The good news is he's above and beyond. Psalm chapter two. He's the one who sits enthroned in heaven and laughs. He's the one who's in control, right? Satan is not a loose cannon on deck. He only gets to do what God allows him to do, right? And they have their day of judgment. They are all headed. Satan and the demons, Matthew 25, Jesus is clear. That's what hell was originally created for. It was for them, right? And, and so their date of destiny is there. But guess what? That judgment day hasn't come yet. So this is why the scriptures replete. This is why Paul says repeatedly in the New Testament, not all of our battles are against flesh and blood. Sometimes, guess what? You're going to experience spiritual warfare. And I'll, and I'll just add this real quick. And it's not just in the church, uh, John. It's everywhere in the world. And part of that is the programming on purpose that's opening people up uh, to receive occult behavior, thinking that it's a good thing. They're rejecting Christianity, but people deep down inside still want to have a spiritual experience. And so the church not warning people, equipping not just the church, but people in general, they're backing up into the occult in droves, uh, in all forms, Satanism, voodoo, shamanism, witchcraft, you name it, it's all on the rise. And then the irony is, the Bible says in Revelation 9, that's exactly what's going to happen in the last days. It's going to get so bad that the planet is going to be littered with people who literally worship demons. And so all that's coming into play. It's all there in the scripture. It's just sad that people don't want to believe it, or dare I say, they flat out just don't want to hear it. And man, that's just opening up. The irony is it's opening up to the very thing you don't want to hear or believe in, spiritual warfare. Yeah. You know, Pastor Billy, you said something that I got to dig deeper in. You said occult practices sneaking into the church. Yeah. Um, let, I want to hear what those are uh, because I've... I know that the devil doesn't have any creativity himself. He uses, uh, he basically creates counterfeits of what God has given. Um, yeah. But so there is real things and then there's mm -hmm. counterfeits. Yeah. Um, but we let the counterfeits in thinking it's real sometimes. We need discernment big time. Mm -hmm. Help us understand some of these occult practices that have snuck into churches and how we can have discernment to deal with those and keep out new ones. Yeah, well, some of it is just a, it's a flat out uh, full on attack uh, by the occult. And since people don't even want to believe in that, uh, then they're coming in the church. They used to be outside and all that stuff, but no, they're in. And they're not just in, John. I've got actual pastoral reports warning churches of what is going on in different parts of the world. And, and, and dare I say, even the United States. And I'll just give you a couple quick examples. Number one, uh, Satanists are getting so chummy uh, with the church. Uh, that they come in and, they, and they're very slick. The enemy, he doesn't just always come in with like what I experienced, you know, with full on demon possession, tear, ah, you know, that's true. That does happen. But the Bible also says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And so sometimes he dupes you with good feelings. And so he, he it's good cop, bad cop, kind of, you know, he plays on you, but both are bad. So I'll give you a case in point. Uh, and this is actual reports, actual testimonies. Um, Satanists have come into church. Uh, a lot of them, that's part of their rituals uh, with Satanism. Um, they have to break every commandment because it's all about rebelling against God, doing everything the exact opposite. It's called the law of reversal of what God says. And sometimes their initiations is to specifically go into churches. Now, sometimes they'll instill fear. They'll do, uh, they'll break in and, and do the pentagram and spray paint and tag churches. And that'll freak people out. A lot of times, John, though, it's very much subtle, and they go in specifically to destroy churches. Let me give you a case in point. This guy, his name is Glenn. He's a generational Satanist. He was being trained to be the, the next high priest in his family, Satanist. He finally got saved, so he came out. He said, here was his tack. He was, he was uh, tasked with taking down this particular church in the town. And you know how he did it? He didn't spray paint. He didn't vandalize. He didn't instill fear. He went into the church. He learned Christianese. He learned to say, amen, hallelujah. But he wasn't talking about Jesus. And he sat there in this, quote, Baptist church for two years. And you know how he brought that church down? He sat there for two years, every service, and all he did was murmur and complain. 
he'd turn to somebody and say, Did you, can you believe that? Pastor doesn't know what he's talking about. What a joke. You see those people over there? What a bunch of hypocrites, whatever. Can you believe the, the decision the deacon board just made? Those guys are dumb. They have no right being the leadership. He's so discord to bring the church down. It's that subtle, John. I'll give you, I'll give you another one. That's Satanists, witches. Witches, this goes on a lot. People don't realize this. In fact, witches, oftentimes, um, they'll be in the service and they will be muttering as the pastor's preaching muttering their incantations. People think they're speaking in tongues. They're muttering their curses upon the people. Oftentimes they really hype it up, especially when the pastor's preaching because he's preaching the word of God. And so they will be doing their curses to put a, a, a spirit that people are, are lethargy and falling asleep. And you know, I'm not saying it happens every time, but man, you go to church service next thing you're like, man, I was just all bright and chippy and what's all of a sudden i can't even keep my eyes open you know and things of nature but it isn't just they're sitting in the pews satanists or witches john they're working and warming their way into positions now that could be uh starting with getting involved in the choir uh most churches don't even vet i call it the warm body syndrome what you're gonna help okay we'll put you on there they don't even know if they're born again they don't even ask the questions some of these people they're inviting is, is the occult people. Um, they're, they're warming their way into teaching Sunday school classes uh, because everybody needs help, right? All churches, man, it seems you're short on, on, on uh, good servants and help. Uh, working their way into board positions and ultimately is to take over the church. Now, I'll give you a case in point. This really happened to me in one of the uh, places that I pastored. And I didn't find this out until right before God moved us on. Uh, to another uh, ministry. And I'm not joking. This really happened. It was at a board meeting. And out of the blue, John, out of the blue, this person begins to go into a tirade of how, you know, they're kind of just a little peeved at Christians and how, you know, even as far back as the Salem witch trials and all the persecution upon the witches. And I mean, after all, my family is from a generation of witches and whatever. And it was just like, what? 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 Did, and you're, you're waiting for them to, you know, candy camera to show up, or them to say, "Hey, psych, just kidding, whatever." No, they're they're deadly serious. And so here's a person serving on a church board, generational witchcraft, mad at Christians. These are the people steering the church. Like John, I could tell you story after story after story of people involved in churches coming to the churches and things of that nature, but the church can't put two and two together because the church, sixty five percent, don't even want to believe in this. The other big bulk, uh, do the math, right? 35%, they don't even want to hear this. And so now the enemy used to be on the outside. They're giving free reign to come on the inside. And you wonder, John, why there's so much turmoil in churches today. It's not just natural. So, Pastor Billy, you said that you dealt with this in the church that you were in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure you've learned since then. But how do you, how do we identify this and keep it from happening? Well, part of it is... <laughs> This is it. You got to maintain the scripture. You keep preaching the scripture, all the scripture, not saying that you got to speak on spiritual warfare every week, but you got to hit it, right? Just like Bible prophecy, right? It's, I'm not saying you got to do it every week, but it, it makes up nearly one third of the Bible. You got to hit it sometime. So normally I think some of this stuff gets, it comes out when you're, you're preaching on it, you know, because the enemy doesn't want to you to, you know, reveal what's going on. Some of it is, uh, uh, you know, God will show you uh, what you're dealing with and you just got to deal with it. Uh, and me personally, uh, I was always trained that when the enemy shows his head, don't give him what he wants, right? He wants to disrupt. And I'm talking in church services. He wants to disrupt and he wants to take over and he wants to be glorified. And, and let me explain that because you might be going, well, there's no way I'm going to glorify Satan. Well, the word glorify means to give attention to. So when we say, I'm, I, I glorify God, or I'm here to glorify God, I glorify God and all I do, it means to give attention to God, right? So go back to that meaning. When you can only think about the enemy, when he grabs your attention and you can't shake it, or he grabs control of the service and that's all you can think about, you're glorifying him because that's where your attention's at. And so the way I was trained was you see something, you deal with it, immediately shut it down and get back to, to getting your focus back on God. I'll give you a case in point. Uh, this one was uh, uh, early on when I came here to Vegas and uh, a demon possessed person came in, man, in the middle of services. And it was a no brainer, no brainer. 
I mean, I'm right. I'm preaching, man, right when it's getting, getting going. And all of a sudden, this person stands up in the middle of the congregation. Profanity, profan. I mean, just would at the top of their lungs. So what do you do? You let it happen? No. Deacons, please uh, escort our guests out of the service. And immediately, and they're still doing it, whatever. But I kid you not, within 10 seconds, it was over. I didn't bring attention to it. I immediately got back to my study and pressed on. Because the enemy wants to disrupt, he wants you to glorify him, and you just move on. So some of it, you, you preach on it, it's going to rear its ugly head. Uh, and if it does rear its head, um, then you you just deal with it effectively um, and biblically. But again, uh, you, uh, it, it's pretty simple. When you, when you get in the scripture, the, God tells you a lot about Satan, a lot of his tactics. He, he wants to divide. He wants to destroy. Uh, to steal, kill, and, and destroy. He he's a deceiver. He's a liar. So anywhere where you see uh, division, where you see gossip and slander, which causes division, the it's a no brainer, John. These are not coming from the Spirit of God, right? And so oftentimes, I and and, to, and part of it's just you know, you just learn, right? Uh, it's just like uh, I, I have a rule. I mean, it could be just people's sin nature, but you can kind of sense it. Right. Not only when you got somebody in the room that, OK, something's off uh, or what I call when things get really obtuse, not just your normal, you know, yippy yappy stuff like going, but it's like, well, OK, this one's out of the whoa. That's usually a clue. OK, this is not normal. This one is one of those ones, Ephesians six. Uh, and you better start looking at it spiritually. So, Pastor Billy, you mentioned we just talked about within the church, but earlier you mentioned that it's all throughout society. It's permeated yeah. through society. And I know from the videos that I've watched, you are doing a deep dive into Freemasons yeah. and uh, explaining the influence that they have all throughout our society. And honestly, it's something I've been interested in, but I didn't yeah. even know where to begin. So your your sermon was great about that. And I know... I'll probably just put links to that, but uh, yeah. give us kind of help us understand what are the Freemasons and why are they such an influential thing, but behind the scenes at the same time? Oh, okay. Yeah. Great question. Well, first of all, uh, if you've seen anything on YouTube, uh, uh, learn to get off of YouTube, at least with our studies, because we have so many that have been deleted, hacked and banned. Uh, if you ever want to get everything that we do, all the stuff that you're missing, uh, that they don't want you to see, uh, that's our teaching website, getalifemedia.com. But basically, the Freemasonry study, I did a 10-part study on that, um, and I didn't plan on this. Uh, it's just the way it worked out. Go figure. Uh, prior, that was the capstone of an occult study I've been working on for several years. I did 20 weeks on witchcraft, 16 weeks on Satanism, 30 weeks on what I called voodoo, vampires, and the rise of demon worship. And, and so basically, it ended up being 66 studies on six books. Go figure. Okay. So then I went from that occult study into occult societies with Freemasonry being the first one. And that ended up being a 10 part study. You can get book DVDs or you can just watch it on our website or download our app. So, but basically, um, that one, again, I was surprised. You're right. A lot of people, even Christians have heard of Freemasonry, but they, that's about all it's gone. And, and almost everybody has a story where like, yeah, my, my grandfather, my uncle, or my dad, or, you know, or, you know, family member of this, or used to be in it, or still is in it, or whatever. And, and they just think it's a good, good old boys club. No, it's not. It's an occult secret society. Uh, and this is what we expel. And, the, and part of it, too, is it's not just in the world, it's in the church. And I bring up examples, again, of not just experiencing occult behavior in the church, uh, but Freemasonry. In fact, this was my very first senior pastorate uh, and my very first encounter with Freemasonry. And what it was, I was four weeks in, and I was just doing a, a basic polemic study at that time on Sunday on the uniqueness of Christ and the cross, right? Uh, as opposed to other religions on the planet. Uh, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, even, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, some of the pseudo-Christian cults. And, you know, nothing really deep dive, just showing the uniqueness that in you, Christianity is unique. Right, all other religions say that you are God. You got to become God. You got to work your way to God. None of them have a cross. Right? Christianity is unique. I kid you not. So I get done with that sermon, and the next thing you know, I get a phone call from one of the pillars of the church, uh, their wives, and said that quote he so and so was upset with what I preached on. I says, well, why? What, what was unbiblical about it? And went on and on. He said, well, you, I think you just need to meet with him. So I drove out to his house, 
and he was a big guy. Uh, and he looked down on me the whole time. And uh, he's like a six foot six, big old dude. And <clears throat> uh, and he, he said, well, I don't think you should be talking about other religions like that. I said, well, why not? Well, I just don't think it's right. I don't, you know, you shouldn't, shouldn't do that. I said, well, wait a second. If in fact, Jesus is the only way, I didn't say it, he did. John 14, six, he's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the father except by me. And that means every other path out there is a false path. And it's not a small issue. It's not just, oh, they didn't make it to heaven. No, the Bible's clear. If you don't go through Jesus, you go to hell. So how am I a loving Christian, Mr. So-and-so, if I don't tell people that all other paths are false that will lead you to hell, and the, if I don't share them the good news, that it is through Jesus Christ, and you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven through him. And he just went round and round. Of course, I, of course I'm dealing with it biblically, right? And he went round and round. And so he was getting nowhere. And so I kid you not, John, he looked down at me and he said, and he pointed his finger in my face. He says, listen, I've seen a lot of you come and a lot of you go. Turns out the guy's a Freemason in the church. I don't think he was the only one. And a pillar in the church, basically running the church behind the scenes. And the reason why he rejected that is because this is one of the many, many false unbiblical teachings of Freemasonry that people need to wake up to. They believe in a pluralistic deity. They believe in universalism, that all paths will eventually get you. They don't call it heaven. They call it the Grand Lodge in the sky. It's a works-based false gospel. No, no uh, different than trying to earn your way to heaven as a Mormon or Jehovah's Witnesses or all those other classic ones that we say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's obviously works-based false gospel. Freemasonry is the same way. Uh, that you have to be a good Mason. You have to follow the teachings of Masonry and do good things. All these guys, you, you think about Shriner, Shriner Hospitals and all that stuff. You think, oh, these are so altruistic. No, they're doing that because they believe they have to do these good deeds in order to get to the Grand Lodge above. And then speaking of Shriners, see, there's many different branches of Freemasonry. Just like, And I use this loosely. Just like there's many different denominations of Christianity, there's many different branches of Freemasonry. Right. You got your Scottish right. And these are just the ones in America. You got your York right, which eventually you can get into the Knights Templar. Um, and then you got your Prince Hall. That's for the, the black African community, Freemasonry. You got ladies Freemasonry, youth Freemasonry. Uh, but you also have the Shriners and the Shriners. The interesting thing about Shriners is at one point as a Shriner, you have to. And this is in print. It's on video. It's not a conspiracy theory. You have to pledge obedience and allegiance to the God of Islam, Allah, and Muhammad as your prophet. That's why they wear those red hats called a fez. The fez, if you notice, has what on the front? Islamic swords or crescent. Is it's a, Exactly. It's Islamic, Islamic symbols. And the reason why they're red and they're called a fez is because that was symbolic of a victory of the Muslims slaughtering Christians in Fez, Morocco, and they dipped their hats in the Christians' blood. How can you be a Christian and be a part of something like this is beyond me. But this is what we expose. I'll give you another one. A lot of people say they'll say they try to give people a benefit of that. Well, yeah, I get it. When you get up into the different degrees, you know, upwards to the, you know, want to make it to the 32nd, 33rd degree, up to the very top. Uh, that's when they drop the bomb on you that the spirit they're really worshiping is, is Lucifer. No, you find out a lot earlier than that. That's misnomer number one. Uh, but people say, well, they just went through the first three degrees and, and they just thought, you know, this is a good old boys club. They do good works for the community. And, and they, the way they suck people in is, uh, they will say, Hey man, you come, you, you know, and you gotta be invited. They'll tap you on the shoulder, including in a church service and say, Hey, would you like to come to the lodge? And so, but then they, they say, you know, we'll help you with your business. We'll help you with this or that or whatever. And, and they do. And so people think, oh, it's just a good boys club. It's good for business and whatever. But people say, well, they only went through the first three degrees. They don't know about all this other Luciferian stuff that's going on. That's not true. That's a huge misnomer. I couldn't wait to expose that one. Uh, because in the first three degrees uh, that you have to take, and this is their words, not mine, bloody oaths. Right. And let's just deal with the first degree. We haven't even got to the third one. The third one's what's called a master mason. Right. But this is the 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 uh entered apprentice. So you just you're just starting out. You tell me, John, if you're a Christian, a true born again Christian and dwell with the Holy Spirit, that at some point the Holy Spirit's not gonna be screaming at you to run. Right. So here it is, you get into the lodge, and the first thing they do 
is they blindfold you. It's, it's called a hoodwink. As in, you get hoodwinked. That's where we get that term from. It's a Freemason term. So they blindfold you. And part of that is because you have to acknowledge that everything that you've known in life so far is darkness. And now you're coming into the light, the truth of Freemasonry. Well, wait a second. How can I profess that as a Christian? I've got the light of Jesus Christ. How can I, how can I walk away from that and say that that's darkness? But you would think the Holy Spirit would cause you to run at that point. Or you're just getting started. Then they, you got to take your shirt off. Okay, that's weird. And then you got to all before you got to bow before an altar, okay, before a guy called the worshipful master. Excuse me, I don't bow before anybody than the one and only master, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. So what are you doing bef bowing before a man? Then here comes your bloody oath, and you are bowing before this worshipful master before an altar. They have a typically a sword uh, at your chest, and you vow that you will never reveal the secrets of Freemasonry and what you are about to be taught and initiated into under the penalty of, and you have to walk it through with them, with your thumb, throat to throat, that you can cut my throat from ear to ear, cut out my tongue, and disembowel me. Goodness. And you're supposed to be a Christian? I, John, that's just a first degree. Oh yeah, we haven't made the 33 or none of that stuff that you learn along the way. In the seventh degree, you learn that they worship a plural god called Jabulun, right? which includes Baal and uh, the uh, Egyptian god Osiris. Oh, when you get to the 17th degree, then they say, we, we've got the secret password to get you into eternity. I'm not making this up. You know what it is? I'll tell you the secret. <laughs> the secret password is Abaddon. Wait a second. Abaddon? That's the name that you see of the destroyer that came out of the Abusas, the pit of hell, that's unleashed on the planet in the seven-year tribulation. Uh, and so, so that's what, that's the name that's going to get me to the grand lodge above. I got to say a bad and no. And you know what the sad thing is, John, for every person who thinks that when they die and then they're going to say the word a you know, what's going to happen yet. You're not going to heaven. Uh, you will see the destroyer, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just and, and John on and on it goes. And, and, and this is not a conspiracy. And here's what's scary. I, I expect that from the world. I don't condone it, but that's what the enemy has been doing ever since the birth of Christianity, Acts chapter two, Jesus Christ is the only way out of this mess. And so what has he been doing ever since then? He's inventing as many different false paths as he can, different religions, new religions, latest religion, this real, right. And just to cloud the issue to hopefully get people off the one and only way out of this mess. Freemasonry is just another one. And, and I, but I expect that from the world. They don't know better. They don't know Christ. They don't have the Bible. They're not born again. The Bible says that the mind of the unspiritual man cannot understand the spiritual things. I get that. John, what's alarming to me is this is in the church. And I share in this study over and over again, Freemasonry is allowed to do their rituals that are completely unbiblical in church services, to do their funerals in services, much of the church board are Freemasons, including pastors and things of that nature. And I'm going, and John, we're just scraping the surface of what goes on in this occult secret society. How can you be a Christian and allow this to happen? And so my thing is this, if you got these guys in charge of your church, uh, you need to rise up as a church and I'll just be blunt. You need to fire them. They need to, and I tell people this all the time. If you're professing to be a Christian, you better repent, run, and get right with God. And if you refuse to leave, you're in a heap of trouble. Yeah. Pastor Billy, I got to ask you, if if people are sworn to secrecy under basically vow of uh, cutting off their, cutting their throat, cutting off their tongue and disemboweling them, how are you getting this information? Well, part of it is uh, the Freemasons who've been brave enough to come out. They get saved uh, and then they come out and expose it. And, and that's why we know. In fact, what's interesting was uh, due to modern technology, uh, because a lot of people say, oh, that's not what they do in there. Uh, the, 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 the lodge that I went to, it's Christian because they had a Bible on that altar. First of all, just because they have a Bible doesn't mean they follow it. Second of all, oftentimes their Bible, for instance, the Oxford Freemason Bible, at the back end has all this Egyptian symbolism and stuff because that's what they merge in with their belief system. That's not our Bible. Uh, and then third, they're pluralistic. 
You can go in there one week and it might be the Christian Bible, but then it, other week it might be the Hindu Vedas or it might be the Quran. Because again, they believe that whatever path you choose, you just got to believe in a, a supreme being, right? It doesn't have to be the one of the, of the Bible. So just because they have that, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. But the, the, but the problem is, is, you know, they go into there and, and they think that, uh, um, uh, you know, it's just, you know, not really that big of, you're, you're exaggerating this. This is just, cons you got this on wacky guy.org or conspiracy guy.com. You know, no modern technology. We were able to get actual footage with a guy who snuck in there with his phone and recorded the rituals, John. We got it on tape, man. This is not a joke. It's not a game. This is really what's going on. And, and so, so it's basically Freemasons who've come out. Uh, most of them got saved, praise God. But they're revealing to people what is really going on behind closed doors. Uh, and, and the reason why they get away with it is twofold. Number one, hello, it's a secret society. By definition, secret. So they're not touting it from the horns. So we only can rely upon those that can sneak in and get it back to us or those that were a part of it and got saved and come out and spill the beans. Yeah. So there's a lot of questions I have on that. And I know we can spend a lot of time uh, debating this, but what influence do they have in society? Or not debating it. I don't want to debate yeah. anything like that. I just want to learn more about it. But what influence does this have in society as a whole? I know Washington, D.C. is filled with the symbology of that. Um, and what do we as Christians do about this? Well, a uh, great question. That's how we actually ended our study on the last three studies. We dealt with... Uh, all right, where are these guys at? And how are they getting away with this? And so I just broke it down into many different categories. You got Freemasonry throughout Hollywood, right? Uh, probably one of the best advertisements that they've had to recruit people in a long time was the National Treasure uh, series. Huge. Disney just did a reboot with that with a modern millennial version, right? But it just encourages people to, oh, this is a cool eclectic society. And, no. And so Hollywood's in it. Music industry is in it. We expose that. And especially because we had uh, two studies just on the symbolism in Freemasonry, explaining what those symbols mean. And then when you see what symbols are in Freemasonry, you see them everywhere. Hollywood, the music industry, the whole nine yards. They, they tell you who they're working for. Uh, but I got into the politics, uh, past presidents of our country, indisputable, full on, uh, free, uh, Freemasonry. Uh, and, and again, the danger with this is you're talking about people that were also on our Supreme courts, uh, judges and things of that nature. And John, you got to keep in mind that again, when a person becomes a Freemason, they pledge their allegiance number one solely to freemasonry and and that means it comes first and you pledge yourself to quote protecting the brotherhood other freemasons and this goes back to their secret hand signals uh, hand signs hand in the vest uh, uh, stand square the per, the particular stances and things secret handshakes on the knuckle and all that stuff it's it's not a conspiracy theory this this is how they identify themselves out in public in secret because this is a secret society so i'll give you a case in point we demonstrated this still goes on uh have you ever wondered you, know, you got some people that do these dirty deeds these horrible crimes and you're going that guy's going he's going he's going up river for a long time next thing you know he gets off the hook what's going on there John, this is how the system works. Freemasonry, their beliefs is supersedes everything, including the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the law of the land. So give you a case in point. If you had a Freemason judge, and then you are a Freemason who has been brought to court, you don't have to say a word. You give them the sign, you give them the distress signal, the way that you stand, right? Uh, and then he is bound by the bloody oaths of Freemasonry, he has to do everything in his power to let that brother go. This is the danger of this stuff. So our laws in our country think they're being perverted uh, with these guys. Plus, their, their agenda is not God's agenda. Their agenda is not what our founding fathers had uh, with the biblical Judeo-Christian ethic and things of that nature. So, so there's a conflict that's, that's going on. Um, and, but again, we expose how uh, they've wormed their way in even into the military and things of that nature. 
uh, and I already mentioned women's groups, uh, youth groups, whatever, but, but they're all over. And you're, and so, so the biggest thing is how can and you're like, well, what do we do? Well, we get the truth out, right? How, how, you know, as Paul says, how, you know, referring to the gospel, how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the good news, right? How can they know unless somebody tells them? Well, how can people know what they're up against, right? In order to fight this battle, if you don't even know you're in the battle first place, and second of all, okay, well, who am I battling against? Okay, and then third, where are they at? And so it's the truth, John. We get the truth out. We expose the dirty deeds of darkness, right? And so that people could wake up and go like, oh, I had no clue that that's what Freemasonry is, teaches, how antithetical it is to everything as a Christian. Whoa, I didn't know that it was not just on the outside. I Whoa, now I can see it's on the inside of the church, so you can clean the church up, number one. Uh, number two, then it's on the outside. Oh, then we need to clean up what's going on in our country. And that, that's how you do it. The, John, there's more of us than there is them, but they get away with it because people, again, back to the beginning, they don't want to study the whole of the Bible. Now you say that as a Christian, cause you're supposed to say that. That sounds spiritual, right? You don't say, Hey, I'm, I'm only going to study what I want to hear. Right. Uh, which actually is a Bible prophecy sign, uh, real quick. Uh, Paul told uh, Timothy, he says, how do you know in your last days? Hey, don't just look at Matthew 24. Jesus said, you're going to see false Christ, false prophets, false teachers, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, in increase of all that stuff, earthquakes. And we're seeing that. Paul says, watch, watch this. When you see this in the church in the last days, he said, the church is going to uh, gather around themselves uh, a plethora. It's just, in the Greek, it's a, it's a pile, a pile of teachers who will uh, tickle their ears and they'll turn away from the truth, and they'll turn aside to myths. And I'm going like, tickle years, what's that? Uh, so I looked it up in the Greek way back, and it's kinetho, and it means to desire only that which is pleasant. And muthos is uh, where we get the word myth, they're like stories made up. So basically Paul says, yeah, look in the world when you see wars, rumors of the world, Jesus saying this, famines, pestilence, increase. That's a sign you're in the last days. But Paul says, now, don't just look at the world, look at the church. And when you see in the church, basically all you get is pleasant things and stories made up, you're in the last days. So, so this is what's going on. The, the people don't, they're being duped. They're not being taught the whole counsel of God. So they don't even know what to look for. What do you do? You, you preach the truth, right? And it's the same, this, this is the light, John, right? And you want to get rid of the darkness? You, you bring on the light. You, you teach the truth, which is the light of Christ. And then, then each individual Christian goes and shares the light of that truth. That's how you dispel darkness. You go into a dark room. It's a dark room. Well, I, I, oh no, I'm just going to sit there and go like, I can't get rid of this. I, I'm clueless. I have no idea what to, how, what do I do? <laughs> go turn the light on. And you don't just turn the light on. As soon as you turn the light on, what happens to the darkness? It goes away. It goes away. That's what we need to get back to as Christians, to preach the whole counsel of God, get Christians equipped on the light of Jesus Christ, get out there and be the salt and the light, okay? And then we would see all this darkness flee that fast. That's it. I'm not trying to oversimplify, but John, that's the answer right there. You expose it the, with the light of the truth of God's word, and instantly the darkness flees. Wow. Pastor Billy, would you pray for the people that have been watching this and they're like, I need to do something based on what Pastor Billy has said um, and just help them, just pray for them to have discernment to, to turn that light on. Yeah. Father, we just thank you so much for our time today. And we thank you most importantly for Jesus. Thank you for saving us through him, giving us the gift of eternal life through him. And God, if there's anybody that's tuning in, that's not truly born again, maybe they're going to a church service, but that doesn't save you. Or maybe they were like me, had, would never step foot in a church service, but they're interested and they want to know the truth. And maybe you're tugging at their heart. God, would you cause them to be obedient and be blessed? Even right where they're at, God, right now, that they would cry out to you, Jesus, and ask you to forgive them of their sins. You tell us that you are holy, that we are not. But the good news is through Jesus Christ, we can be saved and forgiven completely of all of our sins and made into a new creation in you. God, would you please draw them to you? May that take place even now. And God, for we, your church, those of us that are born again, may, maybe we've been one of those lackadaisical Christians. Maybe, maybe we were the ones that only wanted our ears tickled, but we're starting to be convicted to realize, no, we need to know all the truth. And the problem isn't with the darkness encroaching. The problem is with us not declaring your light. So God raises up in these last days as a mighty equipped army in the light of your truth 
that we would work together as your people and dispel back the darkness until you come home and get us. That's how we need to finish. Finish strong, not fearful. Finish faithful as the bride of Christ until that glorious day, which could happen very soon when we get to go be with you forever. But God, please do a great work. It's not by chance that people are watching and listening. And so God, please bear much fruit, which we know is your will. We ask all this in your powerful name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Billy Crone, I know that we're going to have to do more t- uh, discussions with you about spiritual warfare, about the demonic in society. And uh, I see a book behind you about aliens even. So there's there's more <laughs> yeah. that we can talk about. Yeah. Um, but I just appreciate you taking this time today to do what we've done so far. So thank you so much for being here on Charisma. Yeah. Hey, anytime, John. Thank you for having me.